Welcome everybody to Prioritizing Equity to today's session. My name is Dr. Letha Maybank, Chief Health Equity Officer at the American Medical Association. In today's discussion, we will discuss how redistributive justice connects to health equity and explore what it looks like in practice for your patients and communities. We are really pleased to be joined by three outstanding health leaders and just leaders in general in this country and change makers and legends as well. Um, they will share you know, their unique experiences and expertise in researching, documenting, implementing redistributive justice practice in the context of health and well being. They will bring forth um, concepts and ideas that really anchor the importance of eliminating structural inequities, deepen our understanding of what really creates health, and broaden our vision of these solutions and processes to really advance health equity as well. And so I'm honored to welcome the three voices. We have Ivelisse Andino, who is founder and CEO of Radical Health. Just raise your hand a little bit. Great. We have Dr. William Sandy Darity Jr., who is professor of public policy, African and African American studies and economics, and the director of the Samuel Du Bois Cook Center on Social Equity at Duke University. And we have Dr. Eugene Richardson, who is assistant professor of global health and social medicine at Harvard Medical School, as well as its co-chair, um, that's how I met him, of the Lancet Commission on Reparations and Redistributive Justice. So welcome to all of you today. Um, just again, really excited to be here with you all. I usually just open up, you know, during this time of COVID, just asking people kind of, where are you physically and, and how are you doing? Um, at this stage um, in, in, in the pandemic. I think it's just, it's still fully relevant to all the work that we're doing. Um, uh, Evelise, can we start with you? Of course, it's a pleasure to be here and in such a great company. Um, I'm coming to you all from the Bronx, the South Bronx specifically, where it is not only where I was raised, uh, but it's home and headquarters to the work. And I think it's just a great question of how we're doing. If I'm honest, um, it's been a year and probably a really tough year, uh, both professionally and personally. And so I'm I'm doing well and you know excited and maybe not too excited, but let's see what the next year brings. Excited to see what's coming up. Great, thank you, Sandy. Uh, hi, I'm uh, located in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, because I'm a faculty member at Duke University. Uh, we have had a surge in cases recently, like many uh, other places in the country. And uh, so it's a, it's a bit uncertain about how the, uh, how, how the pandemic is gonna proceed locally. But um, for the moment, uh, I'm doing okay, as are my family members. Uh, as far as we know, no one has contracted the disease recently. Uh, and uh, we are trying to do our best to stay healthy. Uh, but yeah, it's 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 been a it's been a tough year. Uh, but I'm grateful that we're among the folks who are still around and able to uh, try to contribute. Absolutely, thank you, Gene. Thanks so much, Dr. Maybank. It's an honor to join all of you today, especially uh, William the Goat Darity, who is a hero of mine. Um, I am just finishing a block uh, at the, I'm at, I work as an infectious disease consultant at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. And so I'm just finishing a two week block. I've been seeing the rise in cases and I'm, I'm lucky in that I usually only do these blocks once every three months, but I wanna give a shout out to our fellow healthcare workers that are really bearing the brunt of, of this uh, pandemic and, um, and seeing the burnout and suffering through it and providing really good care for our uh, fellow citizens. Thank you for that. And, I, and just to continue, Jean, kind of with your context of, of being a physician and, and the nature of the conversation today around inequity, advancing justice and equity work, you know, what is, how do you define re redistributive justice or what does that look like in the context of healthcare and, and medicine? Thanks. Um, <clears throat> so the way I understand it and I've learned from, uh, you know, a lot, plenty of people that have come before me. So 
truly standing on the shoulders of, of giants when it when it comes to understanding what oppression looks like because I'm not, I'm on the side of the the oppressing, um, but redistributive justice to me means simply just understanding that if we take our country for example that this country was built on systems of oppression and extraction that didn't just end with uh, you know. Uh, emancipation proclamations they continued into uh, Jim Crow and redlining and lethal policing and um, unfair credit markets and all of that um, and so that there is a system that distributes resources such that people of color um, are disadvantaged on many material fronts and then this manifests as health inequities and so redistributive justice is actually realizing this history and working towards uh, fairer distribution, not only for material equity, but for health equity. Thank you. Dr. Darity. So we've been engaged in a project here at Duke at the Cook Center, uh, funded and supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to look at the relationship between wealth and health. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to distinguish wealth from income where income is a flow concept of resources that people receive in a fixed amount of time, usually associated with their earnings, in contrast with wealth, which is a stock of, uh, of resources that individuals can carry with them through time. What we usually think of as the difference between what you own and what you owe, or the difference between your assets and your liabilities, or the net value of your property. And we've been arguing that while people conventionally look at socioeconomic status as an element of structural racism that produces health disparities, when they do that, they frequently look at income, education, or occupational status, and they don't pay close attention to wealth. And so we've been trying to explore the relationship between wealth disparities and health disparities. Um, and though that relationship actually appears to be quite strong, uh, I think that the most substantive body of work that's been done recently on the topic is uh, by Courtney Bean and her, uh, and her colleagues and a team of researchers that demonstrate how powerful the effect of wealth disparities is on health differences. Uh, particularly by race in the United States. And so uh, the, the, the last thing I'd like to mention in these opening remarks is that we should pay close attention to the magnitude of this wealth differential uh, by race. The black-white gap in wealth in the United States is about $840,000 per household. Uh, and that translates into a difference of about $350,000 per person. Uh, and this has staggering effects on not only health outcomes, but disparities in other arenas. Thank you for that. So, I, so Ivelisse, I'm going to come to you now, and I'm going to, I'm going to probably get two questions at this time, because um, what Dr. Darity mentions is very much kind of a lot of, you know, the roots of what the work that you do. In terms of you're in the space of innovation. We know innovation is extremely exclusive, right? Extremely um, important in terms of the ability to build wealth and has been kind of the value of building wealth when we think about technology um, within this country. Um, however, it's a very exclusive space, like right? the realities of it. You know, it, it's really predominantly white men who have the ability to have access to capital, whose ideas are valued in order for products to be designed. Um, and so can you just speak to that connection and kind of what Dr. Darity just mentioned, the work that you do, and then I'm gonna ask you in your terms, you know, what is re redistributive justice for you and how does that look like? Well, I just wanna echo and really love what my co-panelists have said around the idea of wealth and how that contributes, right, to some of the gaps that we see. Um, what we're talking about there too is the ability to create, the ability to see a problem, live with a problem and create. And in many ways for myself, my experience has been that I've lived through the structural and social determinants of health. I didn't know what they were. Um, I didn't have like the clinical words for them, but I knew what the problem was and felt like I could create solutions to address that, to address the inequities that we see in health. But 
when I went to do that with my company, um, to your point, Dr. Haybank, I couldn't get any capital to create the solutions that I knew would work and that were really built with my community. In many ways that access and, and holding, right, of, of power and kind of the economic resources really is a huge detriment to advancing solutions and new new technologies, new innovations, new solutions. And whether those contain technology or not, that's really kind of, you know, it's blocked off. It's not accessible. And for folks who I think are really well suited to address these issues, we don't have a chance. We don't have the ability to create, let alone right, pass down additional options for folks who come after us. And I think to answer your second question of what is redistributive justice, I think the way I look at this at Radical Health is there is absolutely the economic components that we want to share, that we want to make sure that folks have access to the capital, to the wealth. But I also think it also comes down to social capital and informational capital. Social capital, right? We spend a lot of time and what happens in a lot of these networks that are predominantly exclusively white men, all of that capital, all of the information kind of gets shared there. And for me, it took me a really long time to, to break in, to, to find the networks that could support this work. Um, and the same is true with information, especially in medicine, especially in health. I often say that there's like a paywall. And for all of the physicians here, right, you either pay with your dollars and the hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt to get into med school and, and build that, right, or you're paying with your time and your network. Um, and that's not accessible for most folks. And so when we start to think about what it looks like for the future, when we start to think about solutions that are equitable, I think it really boils down to the three kind of distributions of power, the economic, the wealth, the social capital, and as well as the information. Fantastic. Thank you for that. So going you know, to, to Jean and um, Sandy, to build a little bit on that, you know, I had the honor and privilege to participate, be asked and participate. Dr. Mary Bassett, I think referred me, who we're all very familiar with, um, to the Lancet's Commission on Reparations and Redistributive Justice. And so, you know, Jean, you published, well, there was a paper that was published that we collaboratively did um, really looking and, and talking about um, and highlighting, um, you know, reparations for Black Americans in this context of COVID. And I would love for you to just share um, how, you know, racial justice and interventions such as wealth distribution can prevent or exacerbate um, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual harm that continues within Black and Brown communities, especially as it relates to COVID. Yeah, thanks so much. And thanks to Eva Lise for uh, outlining what to me sounded like, uh, you know, technological redlining in a way, you know, I, I find my go. colleagues have, find it hard to understand, oh, that redlining and all that stuff is in the past, like, can't That's we just right. move on? And it's like, here's a perfect example of what is meant by the contemporary continuing harms and what they look like. Um, as far as the the paper we did together on uh, COVID and reparations, um, we essentially used data from uh, Louisiana and did some modeling and demonstrated that if the um, monetary payments had been made as as form as part of a reparations package to eradicate the the wealth gap that Dr. Darity described, um, that we could have in this country seen thirty to sixty percent less across the board uh, of a of a COVID outbreak, um, and the reason for this it mainly just boiled down to the ability to um, uh, have safe space to social distance. So we use data showing that there is significant overcrowding in black households compared to white households. Um, and so it's not too far fetched to think that, uh, you know, higher wealth or eradicating the wealth gap would lead to a situation of parity where people in black households could actually um, uh, achieve less <laughs> overcrowding. Um, and also, they wouldn't be forced in the frontline work as much. You know, people are asked, like, why do you, why, why so many people of color are in first uh, in frontline work? And it's like, because we're forced into it, because there, there is no wealth to fall back on. So just those two things, being able to mitigate uh, overcrowding in housing and uh, participation in frontline work was enough to reduce um, COVID incidents in the highest risk group, which are people of color. And the way infectious disease transmission dynamics work is that when the, the 
uh, transmission is reduced in the highest risk group, there's benefits for the population at large. And what was most interesting to me is not that, you know, these findings, they seem pretty obvious and, and pretty logical, uh, but the, the paper itself was rejected at many places. And most of the editors, uh, all of which but one were white, said that, uh, you know, the modeling is great, but you know, this is kind of far-fetched to think, you know, I think what they were saying is far-fetched to think that reparations would e ever be paid. Um, and, and so this is what I work on when I, when I say that, you know, global health and public health science contributes to white supremacy, is that a lot of the times when people are doing modeling, um, they really narrow our social imaginary to just continuing these status, status quo relations of inequity. They never expand it to include racial injustice interventions or risk, uh, you know, structural risk interventions. And by doing that, they, they're doing racist work. They're doing racist analyses because they're perpetuating the inequities. And so this was an attempt at what uh, doing what anti-racist modeling might look like. And I was surprised to find that it was one of the first attempts. And I guess I, I shouldn't have been surprised because that's how the system works. Um, and then it was published and it got out in CNN. And then, you know, you all saw, we received hate mail and threats. And, and so uh, I got my first, you know, real dose of, of culture wars in, um, in really trying to do uh, work that uh, extended uh, current modeling practice, current public health practice into the, uh, you know, what would it like to actually um, build in anti-racist interventions. Thank you for that. And thank you for mentioning also kind of your, the experience of it too, of doing this work, because that's sitting with a lot of us lately, especially me lately, um, in terms of just what is it like to lead with these conversations and not only just the conversations, the work of it, the actions of it, you know, of anti-racism work and, and how is it accepted or not accepted? And, you know, Dr. Darity, you've been at this for a while. And so, you know, Jean, you said, well, I, I don't know how well reparations is going to be, you know, accepted. And clearly we still have lots of resistance to just not even the, the, the it of it and what it is, but just even the language around it and using it and talking about it. And so Dr. Darity, just want to have a sense from a long view and a more of a historical view, you know, where are we now in this movement and work of, of really calling out the importance of reparations? And, and do you see the possibility of it? I don't see a realistic policy. I don't see a realistic possibility of reparations being uh, something that is enacted by the current Congress of the United States. Not, not a comprehensive reparations plan. Um, but that simply means that just gives us another reason why Congress needs to be changed, uh, or who is in Congress needs to be changed. Uh, and that's, that's a, a project for uh, an effective social movement. Uh, but I would like to say that I think it's critical that we uh, analyze the wealth gap and the health gap in the context of what we now are referring to as structural racism. And uh, I'm inclined to define structural racism as the institutional and policy regime that supports white supremacy in the process of shaping American race relations. And there's a, a great definition from uh, Zinzi Bailey and her co-authors where uh, they define uh, structural racism as the totality of ways in which societies foster racial discrimination via mutual reinforcing inequitable systems, for example, in housing, education, employment, earnings, benefits, credit, media, healthcare, criminal justice, that in turn reinforce discriminatory beliefs, values, and distribution of resources. And I'd like to summarize that by saying that essentially what structural racism does, it sets systemic conditions as the root source of racial inequality rather than group-based differences in culture or behavior. Uh, so that's an important pivot. And in that context, uh, it, it also points us towards recognizing that the racial wealth gap is a consequence of a historical array of policies that have been conducted by the federal government. 
Uh, I would begin with the period immediately after slavery ends, where the formerly enslaved were promised 40 acre land grants as restitution for their years of bondage. And that was a promise that was not met. At the same time, the federal government was allocating 160 acre land grants in the Western territories. As it completed its colonial settler project in America, 160 acre land grants to one and a half million white families. Uh, that translates into a situation where there are 45 million living white Americans who are beneficiaries of the Homestead Act patents. And then in the interval between uh, the end of the Civil War and the beginning of World War II, there were upwards of 100 massacres that took place across the United States, white massacres, where not only were Black lives taken, but also Black property was seized and appropriated by the white terrorists, which was another mechanism for building the accumulation of white wealth to the detriment of Black wealth. And then in the uh, 20th century, the federal government shifts from promoting asset accumulation via um, land allocation to home ownership. And then when it does that, it does it in a discriminatory fashion. So including the original version of redlining, uh, as well as uh, the discriminatory application of the GI Bill particularly the provisions of the GI Bill for returning veterans from World War II that involved home buying as well as business development. So the federal government is deeply implicated in the process of creating the racial wealth gap. And this means in turn that the federal government has the obligation and responsibility for reversing and ending or eliminating the racial wealth gap. And that's something that must be done via a program of direct payments to, uh, to eligible recipients in the Black community. Um, one final comment. There actually has been real change in American attitudes towards reparations. And so while we still have a minority of white Americans who would endorse monetary payments to Black Americans for reparations, that percentage is vastly different than it was at the beginning of the 21st century. At the start of the 21st century, only about 4% of white Americans endorsed reparations for Black Americans in the form of monetary payments. By the year 2014, that percentage was closer to 16. Uh, in 2020, that percentage had risen to about 30%. And today, it seems to be in the vicinity of 38%. So still not a majority, but certainly vastly different from the percentage at the beginning of this century. Thank you. I believe, at least I wanna give you um, some space to respond or, or elevate um, something that may have come to mind for you. Yeah, I just think, you know, thank you Dr. Hardy for pulling that together. And even as you were chatting, right, this idea of like white wealth, right, being, centered and, and enhanced over black wealth. And I just think that, you know, that's we talked a little bit earlier right, about this like technological redlining, but it's the same thing in terms of how we look at how healthcare is delivered. Um, and specifically again, in this niche of like technology, innovation, healthcare and equity, where our entire healthcare system, right? Based, created, generated, specifically right for white populations. And now when we think about the tech, the access, even post pandemic, we're not definitely not post pandemic, let me not even say that, but in the middle of this pandemic, um, the telehealth solutions, the access, what's being created, you know, I'm part of the 0.01% of black Latina CEOs in healthcare. There are not many like me. I'm so underrepresented. And, and when you see that, right, that contrast between the C-suite, the folks who make decisions versus the folks who are out there doing the actual work, it really is stark. And I think, you know, we just see that play over and over again and just wanted to add, you know, emphasis to that, that it, it's it's what we're working with and even how we, how, how I get care, how we all get care. It's really deep in that. You know, so where I want to go now is just, I'm trying to also just make it now for the context of the audience, you know, and and what you know what what does the audience do that primarily probably physicians or health professionals, um, 
where where do they land? Because oftentimes when I the feedback I get when we're having conversations on whether it's anti-racism, re redistributive justice, which most folks haven't heard too much of, reparations, which folks have heard of, but not really fully sure what it is, they're not really you know, clear on what their place is in it, um, especially as healthcare providers, professionals, other leaders of health institutions. Um, and you know, how should they be showing up? What are your recommendations? in terms of being able to engage in this kind of work within their institution. I know Brigham's, I think it's at Brigham's has done some work. I know Michelle Morse, um, you know, and, and Brahm, you know, wrote a, a really profound paper that was published in the Boston about some of the work in Boston review rather about some of the work around redistributive justice. Um, and so I just want to have a sense from you and I'll start with you, um, Jean, of, you know, how is it that health professionals should be showing up in this space, what should they be talking about? Um, what should they be learning? Thanks. I think part of it is to realize that um, even though you're doing the good work of, of caring for patients or, or working out in the community, that you can actually be part of a system that's reproducing these inequalities. And so I'll use the example of the um, Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington. You know, they've become kind of the premier describer of the uh, COVID pandemic. They're used by the White House. They're they're used by the WHO to do global burden of disease studies. And and when you you know, as I talked about earlier, when you look at the modeling, say they've done for COVID early on, I mean, it was wrong most of the time. But they also had these plunging projections that were used by Trump to say that he was doing a good job. So they were easily co-opted for ideological purposes. Mm -hmm. um, but in the end, I think they, they did a lot of racist work, too, because, you know, they, they came to dominate how we were understanding uh, epidemic dynamics, yet um, they weren't doing anything about uh, risk structure, racial injustices, why, uh, you know, Black people were dying at two to three times the rate. And so in their gathering of our social imaginary, they were bringing us to a place that where racial inequity continued. Maybe there was less COVID, but there was still the status quo racial inequity. And to me, that is how uh, in your public health work, you can continue to reproduce a, a racist system. So it's part of the reason why we took on this anti-racist modeling project to show what broadening the social imaginary might look like um, as far as our analyses of, of what affects us health-wise. But I think if we also fall back on that um, dictum that, you know, politics is just medicine writ large, mm -hmm. is that, you know, realizing that, you know, you can't just practice and, and, and see your patients or, uh, you know, do the healthcare work in, in a bubble, that uh, you, you, you do need to be involved politically. So if it's like Dr. Darity talked about uh, electing a Congress that supports reparations um, or, or reparative justice, or it means, you know, uh, voting for people that support uh, universal health care, um, or it means supporting, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter movements at the grassroots level. It, it means stepping out of the the workspace and understanding that you are uh, a political entity that, and that a lot of this, um, a lot of what we're talking about is not going to happen without the uh, the political organizing. And so, you know. Oftentimes, healthcare workers are in these privileged positions to to understand health impacts on on the people they care for, and so they need to speak out beyond the hospital uh, and and you know get involved politically any way they can. For me, uh, you know, I think of things because I do more global health, so I've. I'm really interested in debt cancellation for uh, because that is another system by, by the you know how transnational instead of intranational uh, inequities are continued. So finding a, a, a niche that that speaks to you, but that is political in nature, so uh, so that you can you know be part of the organizing um, that um, beyond the hospital, beyond the clinic, that that can help combat these inequities. Thank you, Jean. Dr. Darity. Uh, I was thinking that um, that what we need is a federally funded program of reparations, a comprehensive program that would provide the resources that would eliminate this racial wealth gap that I'm talking about. Uh, and if it's about $350,000 per person, it would require an expenditure of at least $14 trillion to uh, eliminate the disparity. 
uh, that would be the size of the project. It could be conducted over the course of a decade, although I would hope it wouldn't be done longer than that. Uh, but I would say that if there are uh, folks who are truly committed to uh, the question of uh, elimination of structural racism and its effects in this society, then uh, they could become advocates for a federal program of reparations. And it would be fantastic if physicians and their associated or allied medical organizations made a commitment to be part of a coalition to support a comprehensive reparations program across the United States. Uh, I must say it has to be federally funded because states and localities don't have the capacity to meet the bill. Their total budgets are about $3.1 trillion, and that's a, a, a great shortfall beneath the $14 trillion that's required. And then the other thing I would mention is just to echo Jean's comment, which is uh, that it's important to get your own house in order, uh, that you need to make sure that the types of activities that you're engaged in professionally and that your colleagues are engaged in professionally are not promoting the types of inequities that we've experienced. I know that one of the uh, central findings that has emerged in thinking about physician practices and the medical system is the observation that a significant number of physicians actually believe that black patients have a lower pain threshold. I'm sorry, have a higher pain threshold and, uh, and don't feel pain to the same degree. Uh, and I think that that's just indicative of some of the stereotypical beliefs that, uh, that poison medical practice. And that's, that's, a, that's an important phase of what needs to be done because closing the wealth gap will not in its in entirety close the health gap. Thank you for that. And uh, Ivelisse, to close it out. Yeah, so I love, again, what Dr. Doherty and Gina both said, right? And there was a lot of kind of just solutions there focused on coalitions and getting together. And I think um, it's really timely to quote Bell Hooks where she says, rarely, if ever, any of us are healed in isolation. Healing is an act of communion. And I wanna echo that for the day-to-day, -day, right? Um, how is it that when you witness one of the acts of injustice, when you witness an act of racism, and so maybe it's someone not getting their labs that were requested, or you, you, know, you, you, you feel that, you see that, that you talk with someone else, that you share that in communion and you both right, can agree and come together and start to organize there. And the same thing, I think it's true for those of you in patient care or community care, right? When we see a patient who has an experience um, that we know is not isolated. So whether it's people who are birthing or you know, care and you know, prescription access, how can we connect them as well? Right, and my theory is always around how do we redistribute social capital? How do we share, build connections? We know that all movements and all change are never ever isolated, but again, happen through organizing, through togetherness. Um, and so I think it's always great to take action where you can take action individually, but as often as you can share your power, your access to connections through introductions, as well as your access right to information. So as simply as we can describe it, as much as we can make that accessible and as much as we can build together, um, I think is where we start to see some of those smaller shifts that then become the big waterfall. Fantastic. Thank you all. Um, I heard in terms of suggestions, a, a political engagement, clearly at large advocacy, whether it's state, federal lo uh, levels, but then there's within our own houses and right and getting our own houses in order and advocacy within our own house. And, and how do we advocate for ourselves, for our patients, our colleagues and coworkers? The, I will not forget closing the, the wealth gap will not close the health gap for sure. Um, and sharing and building connections um, to the point of where we're getting to healing. Thank you for naming Bell Hooks um, at the time of recording. She passed yesterday um, and has meant uh, a lot to many of us in this space of justice and really has rooted and, and um, you know, has really elevated for us in the space of justice, the importance and the memory of love. And, you know, last year I actually gifted my team um, all about love and, um, I thought it was really critical because what was happening was like this over intellectualization of harm 
um, and, and of exclusion. And I get, and all of us very get, very well get the importance of our data and our evidence and analysis and all of that. But sometimes and many times, folks use that as a cover and a guard to not really realize that the reason why we're naming racism and injustice is because of love and love for ourselves, love for our family, love for our communities. And so I just think it's always important to, to center that in this work more so than I've ever felt before. And it's not common to bring up the context of love, but I'm going to be doing it more and more um, as we go forward. So I really thank all of you for spending the time uh, with me today. Thank you for all your leadership um, in, in all the many spaces that you are and the people that you communicate with. Uh, and thank you all for tuning in uh, to this series, this episode of Prioritizing Equity. Take care. <laughs>